Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Concerned you cannot. I don't see any response this time. Cannot. It says we are straight. Oh, you can hear us. Can you see the screen? I don't think we can. I'm going to stop share and see if that is, that will help. Ah, there we go. It looks like that might have. Yes, perfect. Okay, now I can share my screen then. Perfect. Okay. Okay, now I can share my screen. So welcome today to um, Free Code Camp Oklahoma. Um, I, all right, you can see me and Fletch, you cannot see. <laughs> okay. I'm on the site too, and looks like um, we could see both of us, but I can see your slides right now on the website. I can website. also see the slides, so. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right, we're all good. So welcome everyone, happy to have you. Um, we wouldn't be a tech organization without technical difficulties. That's my go-to phrase when things like this happen. Um, so, Techlahoma, um, this user group is sponsored by the Techlahoma Foundation. Techlahoma is a nonprofit volunteer run organization. We have 24 user groups and three conferences, one of which I will definitely be talking about soon. Um, we also sponsor three local tech events, um, a couple to check out in Oklahoma City on Thursday. There is a um, OKC Tech Plus Plus event and also a another event about um, getting a job in tech. Uh, both of those are going to be on our meetup, so I recommend checking them out. You can chat with us in Slack. Uh, it's slack.techlahoma.org. I am going to have the stream chat open as well, um, and I will keep an eye on both for any questions for Fletch. The code of conduct. Um, of course, it is very important that everyone follows the code of conduct in Techlahoma. If you have any questions about someone's behavior or anything, feel free to contact conduct.techlahoma.org. Um, you can also Slack at conduct. I do want to specify um, Slack mods are people that are going to moderate um, spamming and things like that. Conduct is going to be uh, for more serious issues um, in terms of uh, discrimination and um, violence, any sort of terrible, terrible thing that's going to go to conduct. Um, you can also preemptively contact conduct uh, if you want to advice on how to handle any future situations, things like that. Thank you to all of our sponsors, as always. Um, Bison Technologies and Heartland are our two major sponsors right now but I would be remiss to not mention that we recently got a grant from Inasmuch Foundation, um, which is helping fund all of Techlahoma. So we're very, very happy to have that as well. Like I mentioned earlier, um, meetup.com slash bro slash Techlahoma will get you all of our upcoming events. And 200 OK is the big conference I want to flag. That is going to be next Friday at the library. Um, every single day I learn of some new exciting thing that's going to be happening. Um, we picked up some of the swag today. It's pretty amazing. Um, we are going to have some great speakers. Um, the highlight, I believe, is Lori Voss, who is with Netlify. Um, we've also got some speakers from Cube Dev, um, all sorts of really cool speakers. You can check it out at 200ok.us. Code early bird is not available anymore. Uh, I apologize for leaving that on that slide. <laughs> and that is all I've got. So now uh, I will stop the share 
and uh, kick things off for lunch. Cool, thank you very much. Let me go ahead and jump in here. I'm gonna show my screen and there we go. All right. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, separation of concerns. Separation of concerns is a uh, is is the, a concept. It's a principle, and so this whole this whole talk is about a principle essentially. Uh, so, need to click maybe. Okay, so uh, my name is Stephen Fletcher. I am a member of Gin Studios and the Gin Guild, which we will be going over more and more during our talks and even during uh, two hundred OK. Um, I'm a software engineer, software architect, and an agile coach. And if you want, you can ping me anytime inside of Techlahoma Slack at Fletch. Um, anyone here can ping me. Uh, if you've seen, if you're watching this video, then you are invited to uh, talk to me at any time. Okay, so um, how to implement separation of concerns. So you've got a collection of concerns, and you do a for loop, and you do something with each concern. Uh, this this talk is actually not about any type of um, writing code. It's more about the principles. So this is a joke. There's no implementation for uh, separation of concerns. There's no framework that's going to do separation of concerns for you. As a matter of fact, there's uh, an opposite. There, there are frameworks that break separation of concerns. Um, so what this talk is not about, this talk is not about um, frameworks that do things for us. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about uh, Angular or any, any cool new thing out there. Um, this is not about the single responsibility principle or coupling versus cohesion, because um, these terms are frequently mixed up. And, and when I ask in an interview, do you know what separation of concerns is? I frequently get um, coupling versus cohesion or single responsibility principle sent back to me. But whenever I ask what single responsibility principle is or, or other things, no one ever tells me separation of concerns. They never define separation of concerns for me. So it seems like one of those principles that is um, less thought of, at least, uh, if not less known. So um, what this talk is about, uh, it's about roles. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of roles um, that uh, are, is a good audience for this talk, QA, BA, but mostly coders. Coders would be like the main audience. But this is also a good talk for QA and BA, um, as well as anyone on the vision team business side and, and further back DBA, uh, deeper into that also. Uh, this, this is about hats. Hats is sort of a synonym for roles. Um, but uh, you know, one person could, be, uh, could wear multiple hats. So, I'm not talking to you, the viewer, whenever I talk about any of this stuff, I'm talking about a role. So if I say the developer or the DBA or something like that, I'm not saying one person is a developer because uh, a developer might also be a DBA for a company, who knows? Uh, so roles, hats, and the processes. These, these are the processes, how, how coding matches up with the business processes because those two things are tightly coupled, whether you like it or not. Those are things that, that you go together. So knowing that, we're going to start from the beginning. So in the beginning, you have, you have a vision. You have the vision team, the, the C-level people, the uh, product owners. You have these people saying, we want a new system, a new product, or we want just a new feature added to a product, something like that. And they make user stories. And user stories are, they're, they're the point where the business connects with the developers. And in the user stories you have, the, the BAs will be writing up acceptance criteria, the QAs will be adding test cases, and the developers will be putting a bunch of tasks on these user stories. But let's start with user stories as a main concept because that's, that's a huge part of separation of concerns is understanding the user story portion. So before I like define separation of concerns and get more into it, this is a good starting point. Um, a user story, as a customer, I wanna be able to create a shopping cart so that I can review items I want to buy. So this is like from the perspective of a user. I, I write this story, even though this is for the business, the business writes this. Um, as a customer, that's like your authorization. It, like anything that you wanna read into this, as a customer, that's your authorization. It might say as an admin, as an anonymous user, something like that. So as a customer, as a developer, you read that, you say, this is my, um, this is how I'm gonna be authorizing this person. Of course, you're gonna get in more detail later, but you can look at the user story and then you can visualize these are the people who are gonna be using this feature. Um, I wanna be able to create a shopping cart. So, you know, you go to your website, you make a shopping cart, you add um, items to your shopping cart so that I can review the items I want to buy. Because at some point you're gonna check out whatever the case is. 
Uh, another user story, as a customer, I want to be able to check out. And this is like the payment system so, so that I can purchase my items in my cart. They may or may not check out. They might just have a shopping cart on there like Amazon or whatever and, and just keep that cashed and add and remove like a wish list or something like that. But the checkout system is, the, the payment system is this whole other thing. And then as a customer, I want to be able to view my orders so that I can track purchase receipts. So like later on, after you buy things, you go back and you can do your taxes or whatever the case is, but you can see your orders that you've made previously. Okay, so the business concern, this is one of the concerns of grooming user stories. So from the perspective of a business, like I was saying, they have those three parts and I'm, it's, it's backwards compared to that slide before, but they have the business goal, like the value that they're going to be creating. And that's the, so that portion. And then you have the feature, that's the thing that you're actually gonna be implementing, the shopping cart, the checkout system, the page that you can view your orders. And then you have your audience, use my mouse a little bit here. Uh, Okay, here we go. So you have your audience and as an administrator, that, that, that's your authorization roles and whatnot. So from the perspective of the user, it says as a, the audience, I want this thing so that some value it provides to me. Um, and, and that's why we write user stories is because it's from the perspective of the user. And most importantly, it forces the business people to really think about the thing they're asking for and put a, a business value on it. A lot of times you ask, uh, you ask uh, the business analysts or the product owners, hey, can you write this as a user story? And they, they say, I don't understand how to write it. I can't really articulate the idea in this way. And if they can't get these parts across, it's something that sometimes the developer has to work with them to help them understand the agile process. But um, uh, I don't want to get too far into this because this isn't a coaching session about how to do user stories. It's just that I'm really trying to get the mindset in here that there's a lot to making a user story um, as one of the concerns of software development. So um, the business controls the business requirements. Uh, so they, they decide the priority in the business needs. They move things up and down in priority. And when they're making user stories, a lot of times part of the vision team is the UI, the UX, the designers. They're in there saying, okay, well, how are you going to want this to look? And they're trying to, um, to lay out the page and they're, they're working very closely with the vision team. So this business story that we're looking at here is... is uh, very, very nearby, um, working directly with the UI UX uh, team. So this is a gradient that I'm gonna fill in as we go along with a couple of these slides. And this gradient has the, bus the business slash vision, like I was just talking about, and they interface with the UI UX design, the design portion of the team. So now let's take a step back, back to the business again, and say the business also interacts um, with the design. So now let's talk about the design side of things. So the business interacts with design, and now we're gonna talk about tasks. So I have the word task here. This is no longer user stories, but these are gonna fall in line. There are three user stories. We've got three tasks here. There's gonna be a lot more tasks per user story, but I just put one task as an example um, for each user story. So for the shopping cart, uh, design the shopping cart to have, and then you, you, know, you put um, colors, icons, the layouts and mock-ups and pictures and stuff like that. And this isn't a user story. So this is not following the as a I want so that this is a task. So there's going to be some some technical jargon in here or some artsy jargon in here for for the marketing team or the design team, the UI UX people they are going to be putting that sort of stuff in here. Um, and the other task for the checkout system design the payment process, the checkout process to have, you know, this is the UI UX stuff. This is all the stuff that we need. They're going to have these tasks on their user story. And then for the, uh, for the orders page, so you can review your orders, design the pending and previous orders page to have and all the things that it needs to have. Uh, so business and the UI and UX design team, they overlap just like that gradient showed a little bit back there. The business works with the designers or in the UI developers to figure out what is needed to fulfill the requirements of the user story. So you have all these tasks, they're attached to the user story and they're all in the domain of the design uh, the designers, the designers and the business people. So uh, the UI UX people decide on the roles, the UI UX roles, decide on the direction of the technologies to use, which CDNs to use, which component libraries to use, textures, frameworks. They're deciding on all these sort of things for, um, for their part of the system. So you have the business people have decided all the things they want, the compliance, the legal stuff, they've done all their part, they've created the user story. And they're essentially, as you come down here, they, they inter interface with the UI developers and, and the designers to request, if you see this last word down here, to request of them to do this stuff. Now, they're not going to come to them and say, 
do a thing and this is exactly what I want, they're going to say, please do something like this. And the UI UX people are going to go do market research and they're going to find the best, the best interactivity that they're going to use for the website. They're going to look into the current uh, subscriptions that they have. They're going to do all this stuff that they, they need to do, not because the business tells them to do something, but they say, you know, do the research, mock some things up and let's go over it. And uh, you really try to push this request uh, mentality of we're going to work together and collaborate instead of one person telling another person to do what to do. So now we've got our gradient here. We've got business and vision. They're working with UX and UI. Um, and these circles are going to sometimes be a little hard to see, I guess. Uh, UX, UI, and UI development. The, the development part is, you know, the services, the, J, the TypeScript and the JavaScript and the frameworks and the designers. And then you have the, <clears throat> I think it's the so this back here. So the UI de developers and designers also work with the API engineers to say, we're gonna need to be calling some APIs. So you guys are gonna have to get started on that type of thing. Um, and these are the type of things we're gonna need. You send us back this, we'll send you this. And the API developer will say, oh, we've already got something for that. You know, they're gonna be collaborating. So the UI developers who are writing the scripts, the, the JavaScript and the TypeScript and the services in the back part of the UI are gonna be working with the API engineers. Okay, so now we have the business people talking to the domain engineers. These are the people who are working in the back end, putting the business rules and the business logic, and doing the development that uh, that need to that need to uh, do the conditional transformations. Essentially, the functional the functional part of the back end. Uh, so they have their own tasks. We have a task for the uh, for the shopping cart. And the wording is fairly important. That's why I'm reading this word for word um, up uh, for some of these slides. Consume the item SDK to create a cached versions for some amount of time in the shopping cart that's kept in Redis that's DTO'd as order items until they check out. Um, pull merchant configurations is for the payment processing. Pull merchant configurations from the secure key vault and integrate with WorldPay, who's one of the biggest uh, merchant processors, so I just use them, to send the unique user key so WorldPay can work with the stored credit card and we can remain PCI compliant. Uh, and then query query the reporting data sources to transform a set of cached order items. The, the point of reading these, these words here is to see there's sort of a different mentality going on here. It's no longer we need the user interface to be uh, uh, easily understood by the user and have a certain button here, and it's something the user is going to click on and they're going to see some other result. This is, this is like the mentality of a domain developer. They don't really care when the user is going to see a button, if it's going to be in a pop-up, if it's going to be whatever the case is. That's not really in the mind of a domain developer. Um, so it's sort of like the wording of these tasks, which are owned by the domain, domain developer, they look a lot different. And so the business and the domain is overlapping. That's what we're talking about here. The business works with the backend dev to see what needs to happen in order to fulfill a user story. So all those tasks that we were just talking about, um, these tasks are in the domain of business logic and business rules. They're owned by the developer. You don't, you don't have QA say, okay, QA, create me tasks or whatever. You'll have the, uh, the domain developer in the, in the meetings when they're grooming user stories or talking about user stories and saying, okay, we're gonna to need to do these things. We're gonna take notes. We're gonna ask the product owner, you know exactly what you wanna do. We're gonna look at the QA's uh, uh, test cases and say, okay, these test cases make technically make it very easy to read. And they're gonna read the acceptance criteria. They're gonna build all this stuff with, with collaboration. So the backend devs are gonna be deciding all the, all the things that need to, need to happen. They're gonna be deciding which NuGet package to use, design patterns, uh, core organizations for interfaces. They're going to decide all this stuff. And then the backend devs are also going to be working with data devs, building the data repositories or and or the DBAs um, in order to have them approve migration scripts to add tables and, and um, columns and, and change data types and stuff like that. Um, but most importantly here, when they're working with the DBAs and, and the data devs, they're requesting to them. They're not saying, a, a domain developer won't go to a DBA and say, create a table, do this with these data types um, and these indexes or whatever the case is. They're going to say, we need these things. Let's talk about it. And, and we need you guys to figure, figure out, you know, what's the most performant index to put on there and all that sort of stuff as for them to decide. And again, I'm talking about roles. So if you're the person who can take off that domain hat, step over and put on the DBA hat, that's great. You, so you're discussing it with yourself or you're deciding for yourself. 
but in general, the roles is it goes into this very request and very um, uh, friendly um, system. So uh, the business and the vision team is uh, working with the domain developers to for the domain logic, and the domain developers are also working with the, the data repo. Got a couple more items here on our gradient. Um, so the domain devs, now they're working with the data. So that's what we're going into now, that the domain devs are working with the DBAs and, and such like that. And the data devs or the DBAs say, partition a new data schema with these data types and these columns and these indexes and the data columns copied from the inventory.item data table. Uh, and I don't need to read the rest of them, but the general idea is we're getting into, uh, the, the further you get from the business, the more technical you're getting. And if you show this to a business person, you know, um, the CEO says, hey, build me a shopping cart. And you're like, here's the thing. They'd be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is so far away from the business. Uh, completely different mindset. Also, the data devs don't care how the API, for example, is structured. They don't care. You bring in an API and the API validates certain fields or whatever the case is. And then it's doing some transformational logic. And they only care from the part where the very back boundary of the application the repositories, the data repos, are then making the SQL calls or, or building the tables or querying the tables. They care about that stuff. They care about disaster recovery. They care about things that are happening in the database. So um, the, the domain devs and the data devs overlap and the domain devs work with the data devs to figure out what persistence and entity changes need to happen. And so we're in this point now where this is controlled by the DBAs and the data devs. Sometimes they're the same person. Sometimes they work closely together. Sometimes they're, you know, there's a gradient like, like I've been showing of, of different people. Um, so the data devs and DBAs, they decide if it's a, if they're using a graph database, uh, they're using a database that already exists. We need to spin up a new NoSQL database, or this is a special thing. We need a document database. They, they're deciding all these technology and stuff like that. You don't have the person, the product owner who created the user story say, oh, we need a new shopping cart build this table with these columns using this type of database. I'd flip out. I'd say, why are you doing this sort of thing? You know, stick in your lane. You're too far on the gradient, too far away to be, you know, even discussing this sort of thing with me. We have this gradient because uh, people adjacent to us can sort of have the more technical discussions. And also I'll, I'll bring this up because I talk about the gradient sort of a lot. Um, anyone on the gradient can join in the conversations, can definitely listen in. Uh, listening to the conversation. You have uh, what, okay, I'm not even a Scrum fan, but I like the idea in Scrum of the chicken and the egg. You have the, you have the chickens and they're the ones who they, they give their life. They have their meat put into the system. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and so they're the ones who are really close to things and they have a lot to lose and they have a lot to gain. And then you have the eggs, which, you know, if a chicken's just giving up their eggs, then they're, they're not losing their life or anything. They're just giving eggs. It's not that big a deal. Those are the ones who stand back and they sort of listen in. Sometimes they'll give some feedback or whatever. Um, yeah, stay in your lane situation. Try not to stay, 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 stay in your lane to any client or any person ever. It's not really a nice thing to do. Like I said, be collaborative, have these open meetings. But when it comes time to make these big decisions, it's the DBAs. This is the DBAs responsibilities who can receive input that they'll listen to carefully to people adjacent to them. And they'll probably take into consideration, but listen less and less carefully the further down the gradient that you go. Um, but but yeah, this is this is keeping with this gradient and trying to stay in your lane essentially as forward slash forward slash is saying. Um, and and so the DBAs are in charge of that stuff. Oops, double skipped it. Okay, so yeah, the domain logic works with the DBAs and the data repo people because they're going to be working with models that are transferred to entities and doing something with the repository toward the back end. Yeah, listening less carefully down the gradient. That's a perfect way to put it. Thanks, thanks Kimberly. Um, so now we have this other, this other interaction on the gradient from the user interface to the domain. So um, on this is this is a task, for example. On page load to get a this is this is the UI dev. The it could be a web dev, could be an application dev. It's the UI dev who's building those back services, maybe in JavaScript or maybe inside of their native language, that are going to be making calls to the API. And they'll have a task like on page load, uh, let, let's do the middle one, on click for the submit button. So we're still talking about UI language here. We're, we're sort of moved back on the gradient to the other side, um, to the beginning side again. On click for the submit button for a payment, send a body with the JSON 
with the user and the payment info too. And you have this post uh, API with an order ID on there. Uh, because when you make a when you when you do a checkout, you don't resend the order. The order is already in a, in a shopping cart that's sort of cached, or it's somewhere that can be queried by the payment service. Uh, and so you say, here's this order ID that they've 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 had. Uh, and these are the type of tasks that you see on the web developer or the UI developer who's working in the JavaScript and the native language, not necessarily doing the design side, but doing like the back end side of that sort of thing. And so the uh, the these devs, these back end or the back end of the front end uh, web devs or UI devs, uh, this is the same type exact type of screen that I've already shown three or four times. Uh, they're writing tasks tasks that are working with their stuff, but they're also collaborating tasks with like the API and SDK developer. So whenever they say I need this task that's going to call a post with this URL in it and maybe some URL parameters or some query string. Um, they don't just come up with that because it's not really the a UI developer's task. It's not their lane, <laughs> for example, to tell the API, hey, build me an API with this thing. Uh, because the API developers might already have an API that they that the front end didn't know about, the UI devs didn't know about. Um, or they could have one that's like really close. They just need to do a, a slight adjustment to it or something like that. So there's the collaboration that's happening there um, to work with those, those people. So now we've got this. This is this is sort of like the end the end of it all. So there's all kinds of lines going on here, and it shows it shows the different uh, uh, adjacent connections that you make with people. So like UI development working with API engineers and domain logic, or UX UI and UI development work really closely together. And it's got all these lines, and the bad th or the good thing depends on how you look at it. This is the clean, nice and neat uh, way to put it. Uh, and each one of these circles is sort of like, these are the collaborative groups and they're all sort of intermingled a little bit and it's a gradient. It's not this group and then there's space and then there's this group with like, and they're like separated. It's a, it's a gradient of uh, concerns. These, these people are concerned with this, these people are concerned with this and there's some, sort of some crossover here. And so this is as separate as it gets, which is a good thing. This is pretty separate because this is what you see at a lot of companies. <laughs> this, is, this is what we call a full stack developer. <laughs> You've got, you've got the gradient and you've just got all the things here. And so this is a type of quote you might hear from a develop from a company. You might've heard this. Hey, Fletch, we need a shopping cart built real quick. Not sure what that means. Good luck. You know, you got two months. Here's a timeline. Um, here's your gradient. So coming back to this, this looks pretty good. Even though it might've looked a little bit confusing at first, compared to this, it looks, it looks really good. You just, here's all the things. We one of you figure it out. That's pretty great. So what is a concern? Now, now that I've sort of talked about the different concerns and the different people and the roles, the hats we wear, and like I said, you can wear multiple hats. You can you know, take one hat off and put a hat on somewhere else. Um, usually adjacent, it's usually adjacent to you. You don't usually have someone wearing just two different hats on different sides of the spectrum. But a concern is a hat you wear. That, that's a really good way to think about it is these concerns, these roles, um, in, in a very agile sense, thinking about the people and, and sort of come, uh, uh, combining the idea of how we do software engineering and how we do coding with people, like these are people that we're working with. Uh, so some of the concerns we have here is the look, the feel. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse when I'm doing this. Hmm. Is there a way I can say, show my mouse? That's weird. No, no, don't. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. I'm going to turn that off. That was really cool, though. I just I just now learned about that. Uh, in Zoom, there's a setting. Okay, well, I don't want to go in that too much because it just says look, feel, act here anyway. There's the look, there's the feel, there's how it acts, how it works, how it persists, how it interacts with other services in your same system, how it integrates with third-party systems like WorldPay or um, you know FedEx if you're looking for shipping stuff or you know third-party systems, Google and whatnot, uh, how it authenticates, how it authorizes all this sort of thing, all these things are concerns. They're concerns of the system. And you have pretty much the roles. That's what the roles are on the left side, uh, the designer, the UI UIX person, the web dev. These are the roles that sort of go hand in hand with the, with the concerns that we have. Um, so you'll recognize some of these things from our other videos. I've had a video on cross-cutting concerns and Floyd has had, uh, Floyd May has had a video on cross-cutting concerns, which is also on our YouTube. Oh, you can see my cursor, that's really nice. Uh, it's good to know. So let's go into some concerns. 
this is that gradient sort of turned on its side in order to look like it's a, like a typical graphic that you would see for, for software development. The presentation concern, you know, UI design, native concerns, UX design. You've got the front boundary, which is the API. And uh, you see these circles are only on one of these, not on all three of them. I, I do that for a reason, so keep that in mind. Uh, the API is a concern of ours. The, uh, the domain business logic is a concern of ours. The data access, the, the data repos and resource access, um, they may not be hitting a database. They may be hitting um, maybe a third party database or a third party pulling a website, scraping a website or reading from local storage or file storage, file system. So this is the, the back boundary, the persistence um, or what accesses the persistence. And then you have the persistence. Could be the file system, could be SQL or Oracle or, or a NoSQL database. Um, these are the concerns. And if you, if you learn nothing else from this, you see these are concerns and they should be kept separate. The, the presentation layer, the, the UI, the, the web dev, um, shouldn't be programming anything that knows which database you're using. If nothing else, take that away from this. Um, if, if you're making the UI, you've got the HTML, CSS, you've got your JavaScript, that JavaScript should not know anything about SQL Server or anything that anything's even stored. Whenever the UI makes a call back to an API and, and says, give me a list of orders, it should just, as far as it's concerned, that API just made this stuff up, just magically um, created it and sent it back. It should not even know anything about persistence or even that persistence exists. That's how far away those two concerns are. Now, the further, the closer you get, the, the more it understands the database, but as much as possible, these are the things that you want to keep separate. This is the reason why I only circled partially last time. These are cross-cutting concerns that we had other videos on. Um, they're still separated vertically. I don't think I explicitly said that before. They're separated vertically, but you have this concern like authentication, which crosses over the horizontal boundary because all of our APIs are gonna use the same exact authentication system. At least in this system, maybe you have a different system that uses slightly different, it, de it depends. But, um, but we have all of these APIs using the same authentication system. That's what we call a cross-cutting concern. It's a concern we have of the API and it crosses over all of our APIs. We want all of our APIs to be the same essentially in this system that we're talking about. Uh, endpoint caching, all that sort of stuff. And then down here, these aren't the only cross-cutting concerns, but down here we have another example. CRUD abstractions is another good example. So all of our data access stuff that's hitting um, let's say SQL Server or whatever the case is, um, they all do CRUD the same way. So, uh, so all three of these are going to do have the same exact abstraction of CRUD built into them, and then they can have their own methods here and there. I'm not saying always do that. I'm saying that's one possible cross-cutting concern that you might have. So here's another way of looking at it, not cross-cutting concerns. This is still a concern. The API is one of the concerns we're talking about. But this API may use Azure as an Azure web app. That's how, it, that's how it's built. It's got some Azure NuGet packages built in there. This is an MVC controller. Maybe it's uh, um, Microsoft MVC controllers that are running on IIS or something like that. I don't know. And these are AWS functions. So there's still, still an API, still has endpoints. It still has the same cross-cutting concerns of authentication and whatnot and logging and caching and all that sort of stuff. But this one's implementation for its API is AWS functions. So this is to show, show that these things have their own implementations, but they're, they're not cross-cutting concerns. They're, they're, they're individual implementations. So these middle ones, um, as a last example here, is processing. So the business logic and the, the business layer, which is the business logic of business rules, um, there's order processing. This processing is for customer transformations. This is payment processing. It's the processing layer. It's, it's the business rules layer, and that's what goes here. Uh, so these are concerns, but they're not cross-cutting concerns because they're, they're different implementations for each thing. So again, concerns are vertical. So whenever you slice up a system, this is like a system, one microservice system that a, that a, an API, a UI is going to be using. Uh, it's got the presentation, the API, the business logic, the data access, and then of course a database outside of that. This is a vertical slice, a, a, a slice of the system that is vertically cut up by concern is the best way to put it. Uh, to come back and look at this, let me just, yeah, do that. These three different APIs, uh, is, that's called, that, that's a horizontal slice. So you have these horizontal 
separations of systems, and that's called a bounded context. So one of these systems is bounded by, um, this is my context, this is my data store down here, this is my business logic, and this is my context, and they're bounded by rules that we put in place as software engineers to say, I'm gonna bound myself like this. We're not gonna be doing a bunch of interconnected stuff like a monolith would, for example. So these are distributed systems, microservices, they have a bounded context to them. And those that's a horizontal thing. Vertically, you have separation of concerns. So why are we concerned? What's the point of this talk? Like, what do we have to be concerned about? And this is why I did a lot of the reading in the beginning of those examples that I had, because we all think differently. We're different people. I mean, it's cool if you can wear more than two hats. I, I think wearing one hat is plenty enough. Wearing two hats, that's really cool. Trying to wear all the hats, trying to be that gradient, that's all, all pushed together with all the things from the beginning to the end, is that's crazy. It's, it's a lot. Because each one of those hats thinks differently. So you literally have to like change the physiology physiological properties of your brain when you take off the hat from, you know, I'm the vision and I'm doing all the stuff, this enterprise architecture and whatnot, and I'm trying to do the product owner, take that hat off. Okay, let me put this hat on and be the domain developer. And I'll take this one off and be the DBA and worried about, you know, um, backups and, and all this other stuff. It, it's a crazy thing to do. We all think differently. So it's important to understand that, um, and this is, these, these are really good examples. This is an idea I have, this is like a business person that requires some compliance and case studies, maybe some legal stuff. And, and it's gonna bring in this many dollars. So you're doing all this business stuff. Uh, and then you have this example, a user will find it most intuitive to take certain actions based on how the information is provided. So you have like the UX person who's done some, uh, some research or some mapping and they've seen the way that the users are using the site previously and they're, they're trying to apply that and they're trying to build out an intuitive system based on that information. And you have the data science people or the functional people, the domain people who are writing unit tests and whatnot. And, and they, they think about the system differently. They don't care about the user experience. They care about making sure that the data is transformed correctly. And then of course, the disaster recovery, the database people making sure it's stored and performant and all that sort of stuff. Why are we concerned? We're, there's still more to be concerned about. We deliver release two different things and test differently. So each of these roles, they, they deliver, release, and test the things that they're doing differently. So the businesses, they're, confirmed, they're concerned about demos and user acceptance testing, user acceptance testing, the feature changes or and bug fixes. So if you're changing a feature, adding a feature, or doing a bug fix, they care about that. And they want to do a UAT, uh, maybe a demo for the customer or whatever the case is. Um, maybe phase releases. I mean, we're getting into like way off in the weeds there. Uh, the UI, UI UX people, um, they're concerned about the system, making sure that the UI works correctly, making they're using Selenium or they're using um, tests and JavaScript to make sure that the UI fields are loading as expected, the input and outputs works as, as expected, and the design is correct using these systems that are testing the visual parts of, of your user interface. Um, you have the backend devs, they're mostly doing um, functional changes that have to do with unit tests. So unit tests are, are uh, they're pure tests that are purely about functional changes uh, and uh, QA test cases. So they're matching these up with QA test cases as much as they can for the domain and they're writing unit tests against it. And then the data devs are writing dev integration tests, which are just making sure that the schema um, when their schema changes, making sure that whenever this code gets deployed, for example, uh, more, more like when it gets released, when this code is released, that the database has the structure available to it that this code is expecting to happen. These are completely different mindsets in testing that they require different tools, they require a different way of thinking. Um, so to narrow that down a little bit more simply, businesses care about feature changes, UI UX um, engineers care about design changes. Backend developers care about functional logic changes or conditional transformations. And data devs care about the schema of the database changing. These are such different things. Uh, separation of concerns is really trying to understand that people think differently. The business systems, the, the processes we use to do our project management and our work items, they have to be thought of in different aspects. You can't just like um, put them under one umbrella and say, they're all user stories. Like everything is a user story or everything's even the same kind of tasks. Um, 
people think differently, these roles think differently, and they have to have they have to have a different mindset. So um, why are we concerned? So the business over asks for things that it just seems so simple, so simple to them. They think the SDLC is magic. So um, every task, they're like, hey, we need to add a birth date to the signup form. So you've got a signup form for something, they want to add a birth date to it. And they just think that's the thing, add a birth date. And then whenever you deploy it, you deploy the add a birth date. Um, like it's one thing. It's, it's not one thing. There's a lot to adding a birth date um, or maybe it could be super simple, but it needs to be thought of as different forms of tasks. Um, the businesses, they don't understand CICD. They, don't, they think it's scary that not only do they think this is one change at a birth date, but they think that when you add the birth date, the system is being redeployed, like the system is being redeployed, run all the tests, um, you know, get in there and do all of the performance checks, do all the everything and automated regression testing and doing, make sure your tests are up to date. It's important. That's great. Uh, and, and that sort of stuff will, will, should always be ran for the things that were affected, not for the run the entire system. If your system's fragile enough that some change in some other microservice that's probably not even concerned with you is broken by some change in some other microservice that, that you're doing, then that's just something that needs to be brought up as we need to make sure that we're doing a better bounded context. Like I was saying that, that horizontal slicing. Um, uh, so they, they have this mindset because a lot of people come from the monolithic the monolithic background where when you change something, you deploy the system in, in this monolith. That's not uncommon. Um, even current clients I work with have that type of mentality and that type of system. Uh, but uh, the better ones and the ones that are growing the fastest, I would say, uh, are moving toward or already in sort of this, this microservice um, setup. So here's an example of, of like splitting this thing up. Um, here's sort of the different things. Uh, part of these say, I don't care. So like the API, if you add a birth date to the user interface, the API doesn't care. Uh, and when the user interface sends it to the API, they send And that birth date as a field to the API, uh, they, they send that birth date. It's just JSON and API. The API just gets it. JSON, uh, I see it's frozen. Hopefully not just for you. Oh no. I mean, my internet's working. I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys a second. I know there's a little bit of lag. Okay. It says it just came back. Okay. I don't know how far back that you guys missed, but, um, but yeah, the, the API doesn't care uh, because it's just being sent JSON from the user interface and that JSON is being just serialized, deserialized into a model and the API isn't doing anything. It, it's just a dummy that's, that's DTLing passing through data. Um, the domain also doesn't care. I mean, you do have to go add a property to a model, but we, most of us know that's not a breaking change. Adding a property to a model is not a breaking change. Just like adding a column to a database isn't a breaking change. But the point I'm trying to get at here is a migration, you build a migration script or DB up script or what, you know, people call them different things and you send it to the DBA, you can deploy that separately. You say, Hey, add this column, you know, set it as default null, or if it's not nullable, that's something we'll decide on later. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll put a, a default value in there, but deploy that thing. That's one task that's done. It, it's, it's an agile thing. Go ahead and add that all the way through to production. Uh, we're not even done with development yet, but we know we're going to need this thing. It doesn't matter what's deployed first. Go ahead and do that. Uh, the when the domain when when the API is updated and says it needs to require that, it can be deployed whenever it's ready to be deployed with the new models. Before then, it'll still work exactly as it had before. The a the the user interface they need to know uh, whether or not the feature's on because if if this new feature with the birth date is off. Then, uh, then don't show that field on, on the user form, sign up form or whatever it is. Uh, don't show the birthday field. Just, just keep it working as it is. The JSON will keep sending the API just like it was. But once that API is deployed and it sends back a key that, uh, hey, this feature is enabled, then the UI will show the field. So you can deploy the UI even before the API is, is finished, even before the database column was added because that API will be sending back a feature, uh, the feature key saying this feature's off. 
and the UI, even if it's deployed all the way to production, as long as it's saying the feature's off, it'll keep working as it has and sending without the birth date, for example. The moment the API is deployed and it has that sort of stuff, the point is if you have your system set up with separation of concerns and feature gating, uh, then these things can be deployed differently. And also you have this, this piece of the system doesn't care and it makes it a lot easier to say, just deploy the things whenever you want. You can test them individually. You can set up your UAT for whenever the UI is ready to go and the feature is turned on. That's called released. It's deployed, but until it's turned on, it's not released. When it's turned on, it's called being released. Um, so there's the solution for, it's just called separation of concerns. Um, feature gating is, is not required for separation of concerns, but it's definitely a helpful thing. Um, so why are we concerned? This, this is just a, a recap, essentially, of that gradient. You got the legal, compliance, QABA, vision, the UI design, marketing, UX research development. You've got each one of these things, let's just say UX research and development or, or UI design, um, or one in the middle of uh, functional development you know, for the domain, data science, we'll say data science. Each one of these is a career. Each one of these is a thing that's going to take five give or take years to say, okay, I am an expert at this. Um, let's say you've been a, a data scientist for 10 years and you've been writing this domain code and you're, you're really good at taking requirements and you're a data scientist. Um, and at some point you become an expert is, is pretty much all I'm trying to get at. Legal, UI design, all of these things are on a huge gradient. Um, small businesses, Small businesses are great. There's a lot of startups and a lot of small businesses. I've worked with a dozen different small businesses and they frequently require a full stack developer. Unfortunately for them, they got me. So <laughs> you get what you get. Um, so you, you get a developer and that developer is supposed to teach them how to set up their systems, their, their business systems in an agile way. They want them to do all the things. I don't need to go back through them, you know, design the, the API, the domain, the data. They want them to do all the things. And that's really cool. And sometimes that's necessary uh, for a small business. It's a startup. They haven't hired, you know, five developers, three, four QA people. They, they haven't done all that store stuff yet. They're not there. Um, we've got stacks. We've got stacks and stacks of stacks. Uh, Lamp stack, Blazor, mean stack. Um, you've got, there, there's lots of really cool stacks that we have up there. By default, they do not observe separa separation of concerns. As a matter of fact, the opposite. By default, they are you know, tightly coupled, um, especially the Microsoft ones, but uh, even LAMP, uh, LAMP, the LAMP stack, or if you're working with WordPress or something like that, it's just sort of like all one thing. It's all a monolith, even if, if it's a small monolith. The main stack is pretty cool because um, it does it does still sort of set this precedent that you're going to have a node backend, which I'm not a fan of, but some people are a fan of node. But you have a node backend at least separated from the Angular front end, so that that's pretty cool. Um, and especially if they're deployed separately, as long as you then go into the node backend and you sort of separate that out to the API, the domain part, and the part that does business uh, data access, and you can do that with Blazor, and you can do that with Lamp in PHP. Uh, you can you can observe, as I'm saying here at the bottom, you can logically separate them into separation of concerns. You don't have to have a whole different language or a whole different system for the front end, a different language for the API that's then like calling some sort of different language for like C sharp calling into an F sharp domain library for data science and, and then like some other thing framework for data. You don't, you don't need all that stuff. As, a, as an actual constraint of separation of concerns, but a logical separation. You want these things to be in slightly different projects or separate into different modules that then maybe they compile together or whatever the case is. Um, but I just have a logical separation because that will force, I think I, yeah, okay. That will force Conway's law. Conway's law is not something that you can change. Conway's law says organizations design software whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. And that's just a law. I mean, it's called Conway's law. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. If you break it, you're going to jail. Um, Conway's law is an observation uh, of, of patterns that just happen in life. It's just, some, it's just something that happens. Um, the communication structure in this case is like the, the ticket system. You, know, the, you have work items, you have epics, you have features, you have user stories, you have tasks. You have all these things broken down. If you just smush them all together, guess what your code's going to look like? It's just going to be a monolith. 
And then guess what your CI CD is going to look like? You're going to have to deploy the whole monolith. Forget separation of um, uh, deployments from releases. That's just you might, a deployment's a release. That's just the end of that story. Um, whenever you just smush everything together, it, it just happens in both places. Um, you can't change without one without the other. So you can't say we're in this business system where we are all, uh, where everything's all smushed together. We just use the user story work item and there are tasks, nothing is all organized. It's just like a blob of whatever, but our code is pretty. That, that doesn't happen. It, it just It just can't happen because they're developing things in the business like this. They set expectations of the similar so, uh, style. And so the code is going to match that. And similarly, you can't have code that's a monolith, but say, oh yeah, let's break this down into nice, neat user stories that are separated by feature because they're not separated by feature. You're working in a mon monolith and the business, the mentality just won't be there. You have to change them at the same time and have the separation of concerns, have the different tasks and keep things separate. Um, hot take time. Um, so you have a recruiter and they post, this is, this is my hot take. So give me a moment with my own hot take here. Um, looking for a full stack developer with at least three years of experience. And this is, this is a, a beef I have with the term full stack developer, which is a thing, um, and, but, but it depends on how you look at it. A full stack developer with at least three years of experience, does this mean that they've done front end for a number of years and back end for a number of years? They've done DevOps, SRE stuff for a number of years and been a DBA for a number of years, and they've done all these things. But then after all that experience, they've had three years worth of being a full stack developer, like, like saying, I've worked with all this stuff directly. So three years of experience as a full stack developer, or does it mean I started programming three years ago, I'll be your full stack developer. It's, it's sort of a, 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 a beef that I have with recruiters mainly, uh, especially because they're working with businesses and the businesses don't know what they want or what they need. Uh, and they tell a, a recruiter and they say, three, you need a three year, uh, uh, full stack developer. And actually what they always mean is someone who just started a couple of years ago, they'll take you if you've done one or two years and you're their full stack developer. Um, so a lot of you watching this may be full stack developers, but, uh, but don't fall into the, don't fall into, I don't remember where that thing was, that thing where you're the, that whole gradient, where you're that whole gradient and don't set the precedent for the company that you're going to do all the stuff for them. Instead, set the precedent for the company that I will do development. I will wear two or three hats and I will teach you guys who you need to hire, what you need to do. You need a DBA or whatever, may or may not, maybe that's one of the hats you wear, or you need this person, you need this person, teach them that type of thing. Uh, but don't fall into the trap of being, uh, being the full gradient put all together, which unfortunately is what a recruiter means. Um, so the solution, if you want to avoid a user story like this, that says it's assigned to you, build a shopping website. If you want to avoid that, what you need to do is make sure you're observing separation of concerns and you start, start from the business level, start by telling them, Hey, this isn't good enough. You need to break this down into minimally viable products, deliverables that we're going to call user stories. And, uh, and and then I will help you separate into tasks and we'll have these different work. You need to start this from the business mentality or if you are a business person watching this, thank you for coming and watching this. Um, and and because they have to change together, Conway's law. You can't just say, okay, as a developer, I'll make sure I try to do this in code. It won't end up working out. Um, and then lastly, some systems are really super simple. Maybe it's a static site or WordPress site or something that's super simple in which you could be a full stack developer who's like a super basic, just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and maybe a little bit of database stuff that's doing some super basic stuff for a startup company, that's great. That, that's perfectly fine. No one has any beef with that. That makes perfect sense. All right, uh, my name is Stephen Fletcher, software engineer, software architect, agile coach. Um, if you want, you could uh, at Fletch, me in Tecklahoma, and I think that we're going to be able to uh, jump in a call together uh, if you guys want to join into this. And Emily will be able to take over some of that and uh, ask me questions, uh, come at me with my hot take and, uh, and let me know what you want. Yes, I have people, I'm about to send the link in the Slack and if you wait just a second, I can send the link in here as well. Um, and I will invite everyone 
and I'll see everyone soon.